Welcome to this presentation of Santa Barbara, Land of Inspiration, Innovation, and Ingenuity, Part 3. My name is George Sampanis, and I will be your host as we open a window into Santa Barbara's past. The number of worldwide companies founded in our little city is astounding. Santa Barbara is truly a mecca for the entrepreneurial spirit and for innovation. In part one, we focused on the Lockheed family and what was to become one of America's largest aerospace companies with over $47 billion in sales and employing over 97,000 people. In part two, we looked at two major companies that got their start here, the meteoric rise and fall of the Sambo's restaurant chain, peaking with 1,200 restaurants, and Motel 6, having an equal number of locations and employing tens of thousands. In part three, we will explore one of the nation's leading footwear companies, Decker's, software giant QAD, FedEx Kinko's, and the Hamburger Habit. In 1973, two young UCSB graduates got together and created a new kind of flip-flop footwear in a garage in Santa Barbara. By 2017, the startup had grown to record sales of $1.8 billion. It all began right here in Santa Barbara. The two friends, one a surfer, Doug Otto, the other a volleyballer, Carl Lopker, formed a partnership. After graduating UCSB with a degree in finance, Otto was on his way to Hawaii to go surfing while Carl was planning to start his own business. Over the next few slides, in an interview with Bonnie Chavez as part of a Santa Barbara City College Entrepreneur and Innovation Program, Doug Otto, a co-founder, tells the Decker's story. Without any further ado, let's get started, Doug, this evening. Okay. And uh, as you know, I have a series of questions for you. And the first one I want to ask you is as follows. In 1973, uh, you graduate from UCSB with a degree in business economics. At that point in time in your life, what were your dreams and your hopes and your aspirations for yourself? Well, I think I didn't know, <laughs> to tell you the truth. I mean. I, I just graduated, and I put on a suit, done a few interviews, um, you know, with corporations. Thought about graduate school, but my grades probably weren't there. Um, but I did have a buddy um, that went, I went to school with, played volleyball with a bit, and I was going to Hawaii, wanted to go surfing. He wanted to start his own business. Carl Lopker's his name. Um, and um, so he had this leather sandal, and I said, well, let me take it to, uh, to Hawaii, see if I can sell some. And I did. I spent a day on Maui and a day on Oahu the month that I was there. Sold five accounts. Three of them paid us. And that kind of picked my direction. So we went into business, started right there. In Hawaii, Otto heard the locals referring to flip-flops as decas. Each layer resembling a deck. And upon his return home, he christened their creation Deckers. As partners, Otto handled sales and distribution and Lopker was in charge of manufacturing. After the initial success in Hawaii, they placed an advertisement in Surfing Magazine. Doug drove up and down the coast visiting surf shops and surfing areas with their sandals taking aim at the local surf community. And ran an ad in Surfer Magazine, and at that time, uh, surf shops really were surfboards, and that was about it. Uh, and flip-flops were things that you'd buy at drugstores, and they'd just 
fall apart, 99 cents, and they'd be sure. gone in a day or two. So it was an opportunity, and I'd just drive up and down the coast um, selling sandals to surf shops and uh, stopping at all the surf spots on the way and stapling a little thing to the telephone pole saying that you could really buy these neat sandals. And we had a lot of fun with it. Was, was Carl a personal friend of yours at the time? And when you began selling these sandals, were you partners in this endeavor or were you working for Carl? We, um, we were partners in the respect it was, he was the maker, I was the seller. Um, actually, most of my compensation was in commission at the time and I kind of built my equity position up uh, to where it was half and half when I bought him out in 82. And then he went on with his wife and founded QAD, which is a very successful software company up on the hill in Summerland. Right. Well, one of the things that I was talking to my students about today, which is kind of interesting with your comment, is we were talking about partnerships. And I was cautioning them about partnerships because oftentimes they fail. Why do you think this partnership succeeded? Well, um, we had a lot of ups and downs, I will tell you that. Um, I think, and I've had numerous partnerships throughout my career, I do believe the best way to do it is with one person at the top. Um, unless your values are completely online and your mission for that company, it is difficult, and there were times that Carl and I had difficulties, uh, one of us wanting to pull in one direction and one in the other. So um, it's difficult in that respect. It's good to have one clear head with complete accountability. I, I like that. Um, that being said, uh, I also believe that everybody in the organization should really have an equity stake, makes them think like owners as opposed to just workers. And, and um, it, it really influences decisions. In fact, after um, buying Carl out in 82, until the time we went public in 93, we built up a very good book value um, uh, kind of compensation profit sharing type thing. Uh, it was an equity position so that when we actually went public, 30% of the company was held by the team and independent reps and stuff like that that, that worked with us. Um, mm -hmm. So that was real exciting. When we did go public, receptionists can buy a car for cash few millionaires made, you know, and uh, a lot of people could go out and put a down payment down in the house. That's wonderful. I, I, I can appreciate the idea of creating equity positions because I think uh, I frequently tell my students you're only as great as the people you surround yourself with and oftentimes your organization, it depends on those people to deliver the kinds of service or products that make it great. Um, I'm interested to know, and maybe a lot of the folks here tonight, did you have a sense early on in your life or when you finished school that you were destined to be an entrepreneur? Um, no, but I, I've got to say my parents were both educators and so they always had us living in certain areas where the schools were best, which usually had more affluent um, neighbors and they always, you know, could spend more than I could and I always thought someday I'd like that and actually it got uh, one of my college professors uh, coined the phrase or at least introduced it to me of positive freedom of choice and that is being able to do what you want to do but not having to worry about money influencing that decision and so that was kind of one of my aspirations and I the other thing I think is just I, I'd have a hard time working for somebody else. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of research and a lot of uh, academics writing today about what are the skill sets that a person needs to be a successful entrepreneur. I'm not convinced that there's this model skill sets of a person that would make them successful. But what do you think were the characteristics that you possessed that made you a successful entrepreneur? I think the first thing is doing something that I liked. Um, and, and I recommend that to anybody. Uh, and all the research I've looked at, you know, what are your SAT scores, what school did you go to, all of that kind of stuff, I don't think really matters. I think it's the fact that you do something that you like, that you're really excited about it because nobody can sell it, nobody has the passion for it. 
any more than what you do. And if, I mean, the last thing everybody wants to do is go to work eight to five or nine to five or whatever it is and just be bored all day. If that's the situation that you're in, you really need to look at your life and see what is it that it excites you. I mean, for me, it was surfing. So my ideal thing was just surfing up and down the coast, occasionally fly over to Hawaii and surf there um, and sell a few sandals at the same time. For Carl, he was a volleyball player. Beach volleyball was his passion. He's, well, I think they actually had to take the court down, but they're putting in another one up in his office. The Decker's flip-flop design caught on with the surf lifestyle market and it quickly grew into the mainstream. In 1982, Locker left the company to join Santa Barbara-based QAD, a software company founded by his wife, Pamela. We will look at this Santa Barbara company next. Otto remained at the helm of Decker's Outdoor Corporation until his retirement in 2008. With their growing success, Decker's continued purchasing other casual footwear brands, acquiring Ugg, Tiva, Sanuk, Anu, and Hoka. Decker's revenue in 2016 exceeded $1.8 billion. Not bad for a company which started locally in a garage over 45 years ago. Okay, let's transition over to QAD. As mentioned earlier, QAD was founded in 1979 by Pamela Locker. With humble beginnings also in a garage in Santa Barbara, the firm has grown from a local software startup to a global presence with over 1,500 employees, supporting companies in over 100 countries and with sales of over $250 million. In the video that follows, she provides insight into her personality, her business acumen, and the QAD company culture. I know you started your business with your husband, Carl. Yep. Did you sit down and formulate a plan at that time? Did you, was this just kind of an organic process? Uh, but Carl was trying to get me to write software for Deckers because they were at that point that they needed business software. Uh, and I resisted. Um, I didn't want to work for Deckers. I didn't want to work for, at the time, my boyfriend. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, uh, at the time, you know, we started saying, well, if I wrote software, uh, what could it be? I could start my own company, and what would that company look like? So we very much did um, create a, a business plan and look at uh, how that, how I could get started and how it would be funded and what it could grow to. And I'm just wondering, do you think that successful entrepreneurs like you have to be passionate about their business? You, you absolutely have to be passionate about your business, otherwise you won't enjoy doing it, therefore you won't do it. And if you, you know, if you do start a business, or even in most careers, uh, you're going to be working not just 40 hours a week, not even just 60 hours a week, but it's something that you think about and take with you every minute of your waking day and oftentimes your sleeping night as well. Uh, so it's got to be something that you enjoy. So it really has to be something that's passionate and internalized and that it becomes, there's no line between, you know, work and, and, and play because it's all one. Uh, you mentioned about something, I'm not sure if I'm using the exact uh, words that you used, but you mentioned something about scrimp and save and then invest. <laughs> And I'm just wondering if you can maybe expand or explain that to our audience tonight. Well, I think a lot of people ask me, you know, where did you get the funding to start QAD? So how did you, you know, who invested in you? And really, literally, no one invested in me and no one invested in the company. It's been a company that started uh, from scripting and saving. And so let me just give you an idea from, you know, most of you are college students and from where you sit. Um, so I graduated from college actually in winter of uh, 77. 
Uh, I got, I thought, a very, very good job at the time, uh, starting out at $15,000 a year, uh, which I looked at the calculation of that, uh, given 77 compared to now, and that turns out to be about $52,000 a year, which actually in today's dollars, I mean, that's a great job getting out of college. Uh, and so, you know, when my kids give me a bad time, you worked for 15000 a year, Mom? And I go, yeah, but that's different. That's 77 compared now. So I was very happy, uh, and I was learning a lot, and I was doing um, programming, real-time development programming. Um, but that first year, uh, I, I decided I needed to... Uh, continue living like a student. So I'm going to continue living like a student and saving as much money as I can, uh, because at the time I thought, you know, I wanted to buy, I wanted to buy a condo or I wanted to buy a house, and I wanted to start investing. So that first year I made fifteen thousand dollars, and I was able to save five thousand dollars. Now that's not without a lot of, you know, riding your bike, not driving a car, not getting a car, um, you know, everything I could do to, to be, get by with spending as little as I could. And so I did that for two years. Uh, so in two years, I saved $10,000 um, and I bought a third of a house with uh, two other friends. So we uh, bought a real fixer-upper, just an amazing, ugly house with broken windows and, you know, anything you can imagine. Uh, something that you wouldn't even want to live in if you're paying rent, but we lived there because we bought this house and we fixed it up. And so the funding for um, QAD basically came from fixing up two, three, four houses over a period of three years. And, um, and then I was uh, able to uh, get about uh, $20,000 that I thought, well, that $20,000 will last me for two years starting my own company. Um, and I think um, I was talking to my husband about this recently, thinking about actually this presentation, and we said, when was it? We were 35 um, or 34 before we didn't have roommates because we were scrimping the whole time. You know, mm -hmm. how do you start businesses? Uh, we were like 34, 35. I think we, when I finally got uh, pregnant with our first child, we decided, okay, you know, we need the rooms. We can't just continue having roommates. We're grown up now. Uh, <laughs> um, it was well into our 40s before we had a new car. Never owned a new car. Um, never could, you know, could make that that uh, decision to spend that kind of money. Neither um, Carl or I, my husband and I, came from families with any money, um, and we were able to do it. And everyone here has that capability. Are there specific skills or qualities that you believe you possess that allowed you to build what today is a very successful global company? I think you know there is a set of skills, um, that, and I, I think the most of it, you know, the number one skill is perseverance. You know, because there's going to be all kinds of downs. You're going to have a lot of rejection. You're going to try things that fail. You're going to, you know, and being able to to push through that and uh, and and have a, a sense of worth. It's very hard. When you're losing money, not you know, not making the sale, not being able to pay payroll, to feel good about yourself. So you know, how do you continue pushing through that uh, and figuring out what to do? And and so I think you have to have a, a strong sense of self worth, but you have to be willing to to put in the work to do it, and not necessarily being you know whether I'm an interpersonal person or a you know, control freak or a process-oriented person uh, doesn't really matter as much as that that ability to just keep steady on the road. The ability to take on risk, an important quality or characteristic, and are, are you a risk taker? I, I'm not a, a major risk taker. I think, you know, there's risk uh, that makes sense and there's risk that doesn't make sense. Going, at, um, So you have to take calculated, educated risk. And I am not the, the big risk taker that a lot of entrepreneurs are. I like to have safety nets. So I always say, okay, well, let's try that. But if that fails, we have this cushion and we can move here and we can move here. So I build a... Um, kind of a sequence of 
of, of soft landings in case one thing we're trying isn't working, that it's not everything bet on one item. But having said that, when you're, when you're just starting out, um, you don't have a lot to lose, so why not put it all on one item if you've calculated that's a good risk? Um, and uh, the reason why I started manufacturing software was because of Deckers. Deckers had the, you know, had the need for software, uh, and so they were kind of the model uh, company, although I don't think they ended up being our first customer. I think Gyrex in town, who uh, I think was then bought by Allied Signal, was our very first customer. Um, so we studied APEX, which is American Production and Inventory Control, uh, learned, you know, all about inventory control and obviously accounting and uh, wrote software that met the needs of uh, those type of com companies. Um, and then um, basically cold called, knocked on doors, uh, went out and talked to different uh, customers, companies in mostly the Santa Barbara area about their needs for, for um, systems for their business and was able to, um, I wish they're all here, and, and you do have to have a business plan. You have to at least sit down on a yearly basis and say, where am I and where can I go? Where can I go this next year? And where can I go five years from now? And what's my biggest vision? You know, where's my overall vision? Uh, and originally, um, our thought was to provide software to manufacturing companies basically in the tri-counties. Uh, and then as we developed our software, we saw that it was more and more companies were going global and going international. And we said, wow, we either need to develop our software so that it, it handles uh, multi-currency and different languages and all these other tax rules on a global basis, uh, or we're going to lose customers locally because they're now global companies. So do we want to stay a local company? And then what would that look like? You know, who would be our customer? Uh, or do we want to be a global company? And then what would that look like? And who would be our customer? So you really, and then what the potential is. What's the potential for a local company? You know, what's the potential for a global? Who's our competitors? How do we position against the competitors? What uniquenesses could we offer? You really have to think through all that because otherwise you're kind of, you know, in a rowboat without an oar. Her father was an engineer in the military, so the family moved about, but returned to California to retire. The family was always busy building things and doing experiments, which is how she became interested in math. After high school, she attended UCSB, where she met her future husband, Carl Locker, who, along with his friend Doug Otto, started Decker's. Pamela Meyer, her maiden name, upon graduating from UCSB, went to work for Comtech Research, a firm doing software work for Raytheon. Carl asked her to leave that job and develop software for his company. So in 1979, she quit her job, but instead of joining him, she started QAD, which allowed her to sell her software to a wider market. She began with a few local customers and supported them from headquarters in a Santa Barbara garage. Carl and Pamela married, and in the mid-1980s, he decided he'd rather be working in the software industry, so Carl sold out to Doug and joined Pamela as CEO of QAD. What does QAD stand for? Well, when Pamela named her company, many big companies had started going to the three-letter acronyms. She chose QAD from the initials of a street near a friend's house in Goleta. It was Queen Anne Road, but QAR had already been taken, so she substituted the R with a D hence the name QAD. Their working partnership worked out because Pamela was more interested in the technical aspects and Carl was more interested in the financial side. Working together gave each of them an appreciation and knowledge how much work the other person had. 
the partnership worked well in their home life as well. While their children were young, one of them was always at home. In 1996, she received the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award for the Los Angeles area. The next year, QAD stock began trading with its initial public offering on the NASDAQ. In 1997, Forbes named Pamela as one of the 400 wealthiest people in the United States while featuring her on the cover. The self-made woman was regarded as her own best salesperson, someone who could seal a deal with technical savvy, an honest demeanor, and a killer smile. One computer analyst who has known Lopter for years described her as the Mary Tyler Moore of the software industry. When she found out she had made the list, her chief concern was her children. Mindful that rich offspring can become kidnap victims, Lobker removed the QAD vanity plates from her 1993 Silver Lexus, the first new car she had ever owned, and installed an alarm system at her family's Montecito home. She, as president, and Carl, as CEO, jointly owned 80% of QAD stock Yet, Forbes featured Pam by herself. Inside the company, they are viewed as equals. Outside, however, the spotlight seemingly seeks out Pam. Increasingly, she has served as QAD's public face. In 2001, Fortune magazine named her hero of United States manufacturing. She has been profiled four times by Forbes magazine, featured by Business Week and Start magazines. She numbers among legends of manufacturing and is considered one of the manufacturing industry's visionaries. In 2005, Carl and Pamela Lopker and the Lopker Family Foundation made a major gift to help establish the first endowed chair in computer science in the College of Engineering at UC Santa Barbara. They are noted for their many charitable contributions, mostly related to advancing technology and education at local and statewide institutions. In 2007 alone, they donated time and money to her alma mater, the University of California, Santa Barbara, as well as to Santa Barbara High School and the Family Services Agency and the Foundation for Santa Barbara City College. Our story begins here, in a garage. Our founders were not investors or hedge funds. They were two people who, above all, wanted to help. In 1973, Carl Lopker was running a growing sandal business and realized that in order to expand, he would need some help. He approached his friend Pam, who helped him write a piece of software to help him manage his manufacturing operations. But Pam and Carl soon realized that just as Pam had helped Carl, they could help manufacturers around the world. And with this new vision, Carl sold his sandal company and together with Pam, set forth to change manufacturing. In 1979, QAD was born. And like our customers, we have grown a lot over three decades. We now have over 1,500 people around the world, all with a single goal, to help. To help our customers create products that people love products that nourish us, protect us, products that save lives. We are proud to be part of our customer success stories because we don't think of ourselves as just an ERP vendor. We partner with our customers. We work with them to craft solutions to help them become an effective enterprise. And today, we see a bright future ahead, a future that our customers are helping build, and we will be there 
to help them do it. For almost four decades, QAD has continually evolved to meet the needs of an ever-changing manufacturing industry, both domestically and internationally, with customers in over 100 countries around the world. Sadly, Kyle Lopker passed away in 2018. Kinko's also started in humble beginnings in Isla Vista, in 1970 to become a national chain with more than 1,200 locations and 23,000 employees. The Kinko story began in this tiny 100 square foot copy shop next door to a food establishment. From this humble beginning, founder Paul Orfalia built Kinko's into a successful business which in 2004 was sold to FedEx for $2.4 billion. Paul Orofilia was born in Los Angeles, California in 1947. His friends called him Kinko due to his curly hair. The name stuck. His childhood was anything but easy, suffering from both dyslexia, and ADD. At the time, these conditions were not understood by medical doctors, teachers, or even his parents. He received bad grades in school, leading his parents to pay his siblings to teach him to read, all to no avail. He was put in special classes each year, none of which helped. His mother finally located a remedial reading teacher who was familiar with dyslexia. She helped him, but his struggle with school continued. Paul graduated from high school with a 1.2 GPA. He was somehow accepted by USC. In 1970, at age 23, Following graduation, he moved to Santa Barbara and with a $5,000 bank loan co-signed by his parents, opened the first Kinko store. This he rented for a mere $100 a month. Ironically, the tiny Isla Vista space was located next to where the first habit was started one year earlier. With the simple idea of providing college students with products and services they needed, he began selling pens, pencils, and notebooks from his backpack on the sidewalk in front of the store, offering specials to persuade customers to come in and give his business a try. The store often became so crowded that Orphalia rolled a copier out on the sidewalk for self-service coffees offered at four cents each. He cut a hole in the connecting wall of the next door eatery so he could order lunch without leaving the store. Business flourished and Paul quickly began making $1,000 a day. Within five years, Kinko's had over 24 locations in California. He modified his business to also focus on corporate customers, offering them 24-hour service. After 10 years, Kinko's had grown to a network of over 80 stores spreading across California. He claims that he never learned how to use the machines in his stores, but instead spent his time traveling to the different Kinko's locations getting acquainted with the staff, and learning what worked best within each store. He then made an effort to implement their successful practices across the board. The clientele expanded to include other high-end document users 
utilizing specialty printing, free pickup and delivery, binding, self-service copies, passport photos, oversized copies, computers, self-serve typing, stationery, specialty paper, faxing, color copies, lamination, and typesetting. His open for 24 hour policy increased the store's popularity and led to the phenomenal spread of Kinko's across the United States and internationally to more than 1,200 locations and 23,000 employees in 10 different countries. Orphalia believed strongly that a manager's job was to serve the workers in the field so that they were enabled to serve the customer. For this reason, co-workers could buy stock in the company. Orphalia told Sales and Marketing Management Magazine, it's the fundamental right of workers in America to have the ability to own a piece of where they work. Referring to his employee-friendly stance, he continued, I think it's responsible citizenship in just the right way to treat people. You must take care of your precious assets. Take care of them, and they'll take care of you. Rather than franchise, Orphalia form partnerships with each individual store's local co-owners and let them develop their own geographical territories. Kinko's put a high value on employees and earned a reputation as a very people-oriented company providing employees with athletic facilities and childcare. And locally, he was known for having elaborate company parties in various historic parks and recreational venues throughout the Santa Barbara area. His high octane, get it done attitude inspired many small business owners around town. Starting in 1999 and for three years in a row, Fortune Magazine named Kinko's one of the best places in America to work. If you want your coworkers to think and act like owners, make them owners. Or failure encouraged active participation from all co-workers and generous incentive programs and profit sharing stimulated a culture of engagement and creativity. Workers at every level were encouraged to share ideas freely in organizational decisions. But a problem surfaced. Orphalia had built the company as a series of loosely connected personal partnerships between each store owner and himself, rather than the traditional franchising model by which the promoter creates a corporation that sells franchises. By 1997, he had established over 127 Kinko partnerships. All had to be dismantled and rolled into a single corporation to convert the company to a centralized corporate business model. Orphalia and several other key partners believed doing so would decrease the time spent mediating disputes between different factions of Kinko's partnerships. It would also enable the oldest partners to cash out smoothly and transition to a new generation of managers. While providing these benefits, the new structure also made it easier for Clayton Dubillier and Rice, an investment firm to which he had sold a 66% interest for $215 million to remove him from his own company. Kinko's had become the leading business services chain in the world with $1 billion in sales, and Orphalia's net worth estimated at a quarter of a billion dollars. He resigned as chairman in April 2000, 
but retained a significant equity position and assumed the role of chief wanderer, referring to his ongoing visits to Kanko stores worldwide to keep in touch with his co-workers and customers. He never called co-workers employees, believing it was too demeaning. Clayton, Dubillier, and Rice gradually and systematically forced Orphalia out of his own company. In 2003, he sold his remaining shares for $116 million. Two years later, Kinko's moved their corporate headquarters to Austin, Texas from Ventura, where they had been since 1988 after leaving Santa Barbara. The relocation, however, didn't go down well with the company founder. Paul said he was extremely disappointed and troubled by this decision. I just don't feel like moving geographically gets the company any closer to the customer and along with our co-workers, that's the most important aspect. Also in 2000, Paul and his wife Natalie who had had a successful career at Xerox Corporation and ran an independent marketing firm, started the Orphalia Family Foundation. This supported various philanthropic grants concentrated in Southern and Central California. The foundation focused on the educational institutions, child development centers, and learning centers for those with learning challenges. Years earlier, President George H.W. Bush Sr. presented Orphalia with the Outstanding Learning Challenged Citizen Award. Paul and his wife Natalie established a $2 million endowment at UCSB in memory of Paul's parents stating we strongly feel that working parents and students should know their children are properly cared for and in the best environment possible. The university named it the Orphalia Family Children's Center. In 2001, the Orphalia Family Foundation provided a $15 million endowment to the College of Business at Cal Poly. The CSU Board of Trustees officially approved the name Orphelia College of Business in recognition of the generous gift. The foundation also generously endowed Cal Poly's Orphelia Family ASI Children's Center to provide quality early care and education to local children. Additional donations have gone to child development centers at City College of San Francisco, eight and a half million, UC Santa Barbara, two million, Citrus College in Glendora, one million, Cal Poly SLO, one million. Also through the foundation, Orphalia has funded scholarship programs at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, UC Santa Barbara and Westmont College in Santa Barbara. Why is he giving so much to these causes now? My mom said, in your 20s, you try it all. In your 30s, you figure out what you want to do best. In your 40s, you make money from what you do best. In your 50s, you just do. Do what you want to do, Orphalia said. This simply is what he wants to do. In 15 years, the Orphalias reportedly donated a staggering $175 million, mostly to foundations and non-profits operating in Santa Barbara County. In 2004, Kinko's was sold to FedEx for a whopping $2.4 billion. 
The goal of the purchase was to create a digitally linked network of one-stop stores for customers to make, print, pack, and ship anything. A new name and logo merged the two identities into FedEx Kinkos. With Paul Orfalia no longer involved with FedEx Kinkos business management, he devoted himself to educational and philanthropic causes and frequently taught at the University of Southern California, the University of California Davis, the University of California Santa Barbara, and a range of other schools. In his regular economics class at UCSB, Orphalia did not want his students taking notes. In fact, he would not allow it because he wanted them to be present in the classroom experience, listening, engaging, and enjoying themselves. If his full plate was not enough, he delved into writing books. His first book, written with help from journalist Ann Marsh, was published in 2005 as an unconventional autobiography. Copy this, Lessons from a Hyperactive Dyslexic Who Turned a Bright Idea into one of America's best companies, how I turned dyslexia, ADHD, and 100 square feet into a company called Kinko's. Wow, what a title. In the book, he recalls, whenever I felt down, whenever I started wondering what homeless shelter I would die in, my mother would buck me up by telling me, you know, Paul, the A students work for the B students, and the C students run the companies, and the D students dedicate the buildings. He's never read the book himself, as his dyslexia prevented him from enjoying reading. Because he couldn't draw inspiration from reading, Orphalia, looking back, says, I have to see things with my own eyes and draw from my own experiences, allowing me to really see what my company is about and what is needed to make it better. He further explains, my restlessness propelled me out of doors. How many managers do you know who really understand what is happening at the front lines of their business? I did. I visited stores to find out what our different locations were doing right. Then I tried to spread those practices throughout the Kinko's network. A bold businessman who has gone against the grain in many ways, Orphalia took innovative, unusual approaches to carve out a niche in American industry. Two more books followed. In 2007, The Entrepreneurial Investor, The Art, Science, and Business of Value Investing, authored by Paul Orphalia, Lance Heifert, Atticus Lowe, Dean Zedkowski, and Neil Cavuto. And in 2009, $2 billion in nickels. Reflections on the Entrepreneurial Life by Paul Orfalia and Dean Zetkowski. In 2008, FedEx Corporation decided to drop the Kinko's name, a decision that Paul said hit me hard. In his lamenting comments, Orfalia said that Kinko's used to be about shared power, shared profits, and shared knowledge, but that the Kinkos he created has been gone for a very long time. Paul has also become an impassioned speaker, having spoken at Stanford Graduate School of Business, NYU, 
Princeton, Harvard, UCLA, and Wharton School of Business, among others. In a 2015 NewsHawk article by Lara Cooper, she announced that the sun had set on the Orphalia Foundation. Paul and Natalie, having been divorced for some time, and Paul, since remarried, decided to launch their own individual philanthropic efforts. The work of philanthropy is never done, Natalie said in a statement. Our philanthropy will continue, but the time of the Orphalia Fund and the Orphalia Family Foundation has come to a close. In 2016, Paul Orphalea invested in a project known as the Impact Hub Santa Barbara, providing facilities to develop as a spawning ground intrapreneurial enterprise by providing table space, meeting rooms, and a large performance area for entrepreneurially minded creative types working in close proximity to one another. The successful 1117 State Street, 11,000 square foot property has spawned two additional locations, Impact Hub Chapala Center and Impact Hub Funk Zone. Orphalia is a true executive, manager, motivator, innovator, generous donor, author, teacher, and speaker. Despite all of these high profile activities, accomplishments, and entrepreneurial prowess, Paul Orphalia is very down to earth, friendly, compassionate, and continually curious about the world around him. As previously stated, the first habit was located next door to the first Kinkos in Isla Vista. The habit, originally called the Habit Burger Grill, was founded in 1969 by Russell Burton. Russ was a Hollywood playwright and very involved in theater and was a good friend of Santa Barbara author Ray Bradbury. Burton sold it to a married couple whose first names were Pat and Phil. They moved the operation to the current location on Hollister Avenue in Old Town Goleta. In 1976, a lanky, sandy-haired 16-year-old named Brent Reichert took a job there as a cook. When the owners divorced, he and his brother Bruce with money borrowed from their mother, purchased the hamburger habit. A year later, they changed the name to the habit and in parallel also pursued other interests. Brent started and later sold Galita restaurants, Spikes and California Taco. And Bruce got into the sea urchin diving industry. Then, they decided to open a second location in Ventura in 1996 and another on Milpas Street in 1997. They continued to expand and in 2007, the Reicherts sold the majority of the company to a private equity firm, Cop Riley, maintaining control of the local restaurant. The chain rapidly expanded. From late 2009 to 2014, they had 109 locations, making it one of the fastest growing fast food chains in the United States. From 2012 to 2013, their sales increased by 40%. Six months later, the Habit Burger Grill went public with the IPO raising $84 million on the first day. By 2017, sales had exploded to a whopping $330 million. As of early 2018, the Habit Burger Grill, with corporate headquarters in Orange County, 
has over 200 locations in 10 states, two in China, and in the United Arab Emirates, with plans to expand into the United Kingdom with 30 more restaurants. All the while, the Reichert brothers maintain direct ownership of the habits in Santa Barbara County, including the Old Town Galita, La Cumbra Plaza, and State Street locations. Brent Reichert founded Reichert Brothers Enterprises, maintaining corporate headquarters on Hitchcock Way in Santa Barbara, while spending much of his time growing his Southern California restaurant chain of a similar concept, Hook Burger, and operating the Padero Beach Grill in Carpinteria. The habit remains his first true love, stating, integrity begets quality, and passionate employees strive to make the chain the best, not the biggest. The pricing appeals to everybody. We don't change quality for price. Whether a Lockheed, Sambo's, Motel 6, Decker's, QAD, Kinko's, The Habit, or a company I have not detailed in this presentation series, like Territory Ahead, Giordano's, Sonos, Procore, or those that follow, The one common ingredient for Santa Barbara's reputation as a land of inspiration, innovation, and ingenuity that has fostered some of the country's best enterprises is through its greatest resource, its people. Thank you.